We're going to look at Ephesians chapter 5 this morning. We're going to be talking about the marriage relationship, but we're really going to be talking about, it's going to apply, the principles we talk about are going to apply to all of our relationships. So whether you're married or not, you're going to get something out of this message this morning. But we titled it After the Rose. Uh, Some of you maybe have been spending extra time with your spouse. And maybe after all this extra time with your spouse, you are ready to strangle them. (laughs) Hopefully, in this extra time with your spouse, uh, you've gone deeper in your relationship and you've grown deeper in your love for each other as you've had time to spend extra time together during this quarantine. Wherever you're at in your relationships, I hope that you can learn something from what Ephesians 5, what the biblical pattern for our relationships is all about. And we're going to look at especially Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. Here's what it says. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Oh, that word submit. We don't like that. Well, let me not speak for everybody, but I don't like that word submit. It is not an easy word to hear, even to process. Submit comes with a lot of negative connotations. And we work so hard, especially in our culture, to preserve our rights. And we have a long list of what we have a right to. We have a right to life. We have a a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's what our country and our culture is built on, are those rights. And we want to defend people's rights, and we should, and we need to do that. But in our culture, so often what we stand up for and the rights that we defend for others is attached to power. And we link rights with power, that there needs to be laws to enforce those rights. And there needs to be law enforcement behind it, government that backs up defending those whose rights are broken or infringed upon or taken away. And that's a good process. But when we see Ephesians chapter 5, 21, we understand that the kingdom of God is built on something different. There was an incredible power in the kingdom of God, but that power is built on what Ephesians 5, 21 talks about. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And we have to keep in mind, too, that when Paul wrote, that he's the writer of Ephesians to the church in Ephesus and likely to other churches as well, to help people in their culture understand how they lived as families, as husbands and wives, as parents, as employers and employees. And that's what he does as he goes through the next few verses in Ephesians 5 and part of chapter 6. And But at the foundation of all those relationships is this verse. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And part of what's going on in the culture here is as Christianity is spreading, the Roman Empire is threatened by Christianity. Because part of what Jesus Christ did was he he valued women in a way that the culture did not. He valued children in a way that the culture did not. And the Roman Empire was threatened by that. And they said, man, here comes Christianity and they're busting up all of our family relationships and the way the husband's in charge and, the, and it flows from that. And if, if Jesus Christ and Christianity messes with that, there's going to be a problem. So part of what Paul writes here in Ephesians 5 and 6 is that he wants to reassure those in the Roman Empire that the family structure, there's still unique roles between husbands and wives and parents and children and employees and employers. And those things are going to remain to a certain extent, but built into those relationships is a whole new understanding. And it's just as revolutionary in what Paul writes here because he says, We submit to one another. And what we do when we submit is ultimately we have to give up our rights. And that doesn't come easy, right? In order for other people's rights to be preserved, in in order to honor and reverence our spouses, we have to give up our rights. We have to submit our agendas and our wants and our needs to somebody else. 
And that's what Ephesians 5 is built on. And, and it ultimately gives us three things. It gives us a pattern, a purpose, and power. And we're going to look at each one of those things in Ephesians 5 here in the following verses. We're going to look at pattern, the pattern for how we love each other in a marriage relationship and in other relationships. We're going to look at the purpose and we're going to look at the power. So let's dive in. The first one is the pattern. The pattern for our relationships is built on a biblical concept called covenant. And for this, we go all the way back to Ephesians 5.31, and it goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. It says this, For this reason, a man will leave his mother and father and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And those are covenant words. That is a foundationally covenant idea that two people come together and make an agreement and when a husband and wife do that they become one flesh now our relationships in our culture the most familiar relationship we have is a consumer relationship and so we tend to build a lot of our relationships on that idea of a consumer relationship if I invest something if I pay for something I'm going to I'm going to get something in return and we apply that in our marriage relationships as well. We say, if I'm going to invest in the, this relationship, I'm going to expect to get something in return. Covenant relationships don't work that way. Because ultimately, covenant relationships are grounded in God's covenant with us. And all the way back in the Old Testament, God made a covenant with Abraham, and he said, I'm going to be your God, and you're going to be my people. Your descendants after you are going to be my people. And, and one time when God makes this covenant with Abraham, he basically says, I'm going to stake my life on this covenant. I will give my life to preserve this covenant. And he uses uh, sacrificial language. He has Abraham cut animals in half, and then a smoking fire pot passes in between those animals. But the, the gist of the message from God is Abraham... I'm going to stake my life on this covenant. And of course, that's exactly what he does in the person of Jesus Christ. There's another great example of this covenant in the Old Testament when we see the person of Ruth. We don't have time to go into the whole story, but let me just give you the gist of it. Ruth is a widow. Her mother-in-law is also a widow. They've both lost their husbands. And to lose their husbands in that ancient culture was to be destitute. They were looking forward to a life of poverty and struggling through life for the rest of their lives, most likely. For Ruth, she was younger, so she had the hope that she could marry again and she could have some semblance of peace and, and contentment in life. But Naomi didn't have that. And so Naomi is going to leave Ruth's land because Ruth lives outside of Israel. She's not an Israelite. And Naomi is going to go back to her land and hopefully some relative will take care of her. And Ruth says, I'm going to go with you, Naomi. And Naomi says, no, Ruth, that's a bad idea. You're not going to go with me. Because to follow me means poverty. And you don't, you know, you've, you're young. You can find another husband. You go back to your people, to your land. And this is what Ruth says. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Where you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. Wow. Isn't that an amazing statement? Do you have friends like that in your life? Do you have relationships like that in your life? I hope your relationship with your spouse is built on that kind of commitment. Those are really the heart of some of the vows that we speak in our marriage ceremonies. That is what happens after the rose. After the romance, which always ebbs and flows, right? Romance ebbs and flows in our lives. And this is an ebb time in the relationship between Ruth and Naomi. This is a time of loss and hurt and pain and uncertain future. And this is the time when Ruth says, Naomi, I'm with you. No matter what the future holds, someday when you die, I'm going to be buried right next to you because I'm with you no matter what. You might be a sinking ship. You might be a lost cause, but I'm with you, and I'm going to stay with you no matter what. And that's the kind of pattern that is the covenant pattern. 
that our relationships are built on, that kind of covenant commitment. So that's the pattern. Here's the purpose. The purpose is this. And for this, we're going to look at the word sanctification. And I know that's a big word. We'll talk through about what sanctification means. And we find it in these verses. Verses 25 through 27 of Ephesians chapter 5 say this. Just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. So here's what Paul is doing. He's saying your marriage relationship is mirrored in Christ's love for the church. Christ's love for the church, his intent in giving up his life and submitting himself even unto death to the cross was to make us holy. And he parallels that to marriage. He says that's part of what you're going to experience in marriage. And here's the kicker. See, because our marriages, the purpose of our marriages is not our happiness. And so often we think that's what it is, that, that if we invest in this relationship that we should get happiness and satisfaction and contentment and all sorts of other good things out of that relationship. Doesn't mean those things never happen. Hopefully we have a rich measure of that, but those things are not the purpose. And when we make those things the purpose, we set ourselves up for trouble in marriage. Because the purpose of our marriage is not our happiness, but our holiness. That we as spouses sharpen each other. And hopefully, if we follow God's purposes for our marriage, what happens is that we learn the foibles and the brokenness, the joys and the hurts, the goods and the bads in our spouse. And chances are our spouse knows us better than anybody else does. We've been vulnerable with them in unique ways. We've invested trust in each other. And they know us the way nobody else does. My wife knows me the way nobody else does. And that gives her an incredible opportunity to file down the rough edges of who I am. And she does that in a beautiful way sometimes. And hopefully I help her do the same. And as we grow in our relationship together, part of what God is accomplishing in our relationship is he is making both of us look more like his son. And that is the goal of your marriage. And once you understand that that is the goal of your marriage, it shifts the whole understanding of why we are together and what we're working at and what we're pursuing. There's a great story in the epic uh, novel by Homer, uh, The Odyssey, where Odysseus is on a journey and in book 12, he's, he's going past these famous islands and he's heard about the island where the sirens sing to the sailors. And as the sirens sing, they tempt them and they draw them into the rocks where their ships are destroyed. And then the sirens move in and kill all the sailors on the ships. And Odysseus doesn't want to fall into that trap, but he's curious. He's curious about the siren song. So he tells all of his sailors to fill their ears with wax and to tie him to the mast. He leaves the wax out of his ears because he's curious. He wants to hear the siren song. And then he instructs his sailors, no matter what, no matter what I do, I may be temporarily insane. No matter what I say or do, do not untie me from this mast. And so they sail near the islands and Odysseus begins to hear the song of the sirens. And he begins to command his sailors to untie him. He threatens them. He does everything he can to get them to untie him. But he has given the instructions, no matter what, do not untie me from this mast. And it's a beautiful picture for us. that when we enter into those kinds of covenant relationships the marriage relationship, tie me to the mast. 
No, I may be temporarily insane because marriage does that to us sometimes, doesn't it? I know it has for our marriage that I, on a regular basis, drive my wife temporarily insane, right? And, and there are times when we just say, man, I can't take this. And yet we have other people in our lives. I have some guys who I call on a regular basis, discipling relationships, who sharpen me, who, who help me be a better husband, who tie me to the mast and do not let me go. And we need people like that who will say, these are the vows that you made in your marriage relationship. You are bound to the mast. Make it work. Uh, you might be temporarily insane right now, but this is who you're tied to. And I know that sometimes marriages fail. And there are things that enter into our lives and brokenness. And I just want to be clear. Uh, marriage is a big deal, but it is not the biggest deal. Uh, the gospel, our relationship with Jesus Christ is the biggest deal. And our brokenness in marriage, uh, and it wreaks havoc in our lives sometimes if children are involved. It, it wreaks havoc in their lives as well. But there is forgiveness and there is hope that God will bring good out of the brokenness of broken marriages as well. And it's not an easy thing. It takes a process to recover from that. But there is healing and there is hope even in that brokenness. But part of what Ephesians 5 calls us to is to understand that our marriage relationships are going to be challenging. And we are built on the idea that we are empowered by a covenant relationship, that the goal of our marriages is to make us more like Jesus Christ, uh, not to bring us happiness and joy and peace and all those good things. And if we keep the right purpose in mind, ultimately those other things come to us. We experience a genuine and a deep joy when we pursue holiness in our marriage relationships. Last piece is this, and we'll end with this one, and that is power. That power is built on Christ's love. And we see this, we looked at verse 25 already, we're going to look at it again. It says, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's where the power in our marriages comes. Because part of what happens is we begin to understand that uh, we've got issues, right? I've got issues. I've got some pretty deep, messed up issues. Uh, my wife doesn't have any of those, but I have. You know, we've all, as human beings, when two human beings come together, we've got some pretty broken issues in each of our lives. And that Jesus Christ loves us in the midst of that brokenness. And he attaches himself to us just the way Ruth attached herself to Naomi. And he loves us in the midst of that. And that is the power on which our marriage relationships is built. I had two young men come to me and ask for my daughter's hands in marriage. I have two daughters, just to be clear. John and Brian came to me at different times and places. And to both John and Brian, I was excited to say yes. But to both of them, I said this. If you're going to love my daughter, the best way that you can love my daughter is to love God more than you love anything or anyone else. And both of them are pursuing that relationship uh, in their love for God as they seek to love my daughters. And part of what that means is is saying this is where the power comes from. Because if we look to our marriage relationship to fill the empty space that's in us, and we all feel that emptiness, and sometimes it's stronger than other times in our lives. And maybe this time of isolation and all this COVID-19 quarantine has, has brought up some of that emptiness in you. And maybe you're feeling it more than you normally do. Another person will never fill that emptiness. Hear that. Another person can never fill that emptiness. And if you look to another person to fill that emptiness, you will be disappointed. 
And you're going to fall into that consumer relationship again and say, well, if I'm not getting that emptiness filled, then I'm out. And here's part of what we understand about our relationship with Jesus Christ is that Jesus Christ came into the world and the only logical, solid explanation for why he changed the course of history, this man, was that he was, he was more than a man. And that Jesus Christ entered into the world in order to bridge the chasm that exists between humanity and God. And by his grace, his love, his selfless sacrifice, he did exactly that. He bridged the chasm between us and God. He fills the empty place in us, in our souls, that can only be filled by a relationship with God. Because that's what we were created for. We were created to be in relationship with God. And that is where the power in our marriage relationship comes from. That is where the power comes from in every human relationship, is that we are bound together with God. And by his presence and power in us, we have the the strength and the ability beyond ourselves to love people even when they hurt us, even when they betray us. And your marriage relationship will come with that. Every marriage does. There will be little hurts, little betrayals, big hurts, big betrayals. And the only thing that will give us the strength to love our spouse through that brokenness is the power of God's grace in us through the person of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for the grace that you give us. I pray that we could give that grace to each other especially to our spouses in the marriage relationship, to our children, to the people that you place in our lives. Help us to love you more than we love anything else so that we can love each other more. It's in Jesus' name that we pray.